I thought we were here to talk about Occupy Little Rock, Skip, so. Get no takers on that one, so. Well, thank you all for turning out today, and uh, we are pleased to bring you some of the information. We may, you may not be pleased for us to bring you some of the information we're going to share with you today, but uh, kind of a, a little overview of what we're going to do is we're going to walk through our latest consumer confidence survey where we have uh, polled almost 500 Arkansans. This is something we've been doing on a quarterly basis all this year to try to gauge some attitudes about what's going on in the economy, what's going on with jobs, what's going on with personal finances, and how all of that is kind of influencing consumer behavior um, so that we can look at what's happened in the past, what's kind of happening in the present, and what's going in the future. I'm going to walk through our latest results, which we haven't even published yet, uh, in our, uh, on our website or on our TV show or radio show, so you're going to get the advanced screening of all of this today. Uh, at the end of my presentation of some of the top lines, Dr. Jay Barth, um, Hendricks College is our polling partner in all of these endeavors, is going to walk you through some cross-tab data that has some real interesting kind of underlying messages, and I'll let him give his interpretation of that. And then French is going to put all of this in the context of uh, the business environment, a little bit of historical context, and a little bit of going forward of how businesses are using some of this data that we're presenting and what they can do with it going forward. So before we kind of roll through our first question here, I'm reminded because of the, what some of the outcomes in this poll have been. All year long, we've seen a really, really poor negative um, outlook on consumer confidence in Arkansas. Uh, Maria Haley, the former AEDC director, whom I got to interview about two weeks, maybe a week and a half before she passed away, and I know there's some AEDC people here today that will appreciate this story, all of you will. Uh, before we started rolling tape, we were just talking a little bit about what we were going to, you know, kind of go over and cover. And in general, we were going to talk about the economy and what was going on. And she said, well, Roby, you know, it's real crappy out there. <laughs> so uh, I chose not to put that on tape for the interview with her. So uh, we do a little selective editing from time to time. So. Let's walk through our first uh, question here. We've asked a couple of these questions consistently over uh, the three quarters that we've been doing this. Our first question that we've always asked is, how would you describe your personal financial situation? Are you better off? Are you worse off? Are you about the same as you were six months ago financially? And you can see we've had a lot of consistency in this number. Uh, you see a little bit, uh, first quarter numbers are on the left, second quarter numbers in the middle, third quarter numbers on the right. And, Basically, we've seen some shift between my finances are about the same to my finances are getting worse. We have not seen much improvement in the, the positive response to that question uh, in any of the three quarters that were there. And, and quite frankly, 10% of our Kansans, 1 in 10, think that they're going to be um, describe their personal financial situation as better off than it was six months ago kind of gives you an impression and you've seen it for three quarters now so you can take that data back even another six months. This, uh, this is not too far off from what we've seen in some other state polling data. It's not too far off from what we've seen in some national polling data either. So, And we've even, we do uh, a, a report similar to this just for the Fort Smith metro area and its numbers are even a little bit worse than this and they've obviously had some economic hardship up there. So. These numbers aren't surprising, I guess is my point. Looking ahead, do you think that in six months your personal financial situation will be better off, worse off, or about the same? Again, we've seen kind of a lot of consistency here. Again, the numbers just kind of move between about the same to worse or uh, the other direction. 13.5% uh, think that they're going to be better off. So a few more think that they're going to be better off um, six months from now than they feel like they have been doing over the last six months. Uh, this is the question that we've seen where we have had the most volatility and kind of the most interesting responses. As a consumer, do you think that you're going to spend more money or less money for goods and services over the next six months? And I think this is a predictor, we hope, of people's attitudes going forward. And for this quarter, this question being asked, it may not resonate in people's minds necessarily, but this is kind of our predictor of what you see happening with um, the upcoming holiday season. So in the next six months, that will certainly fall in this category. Uh, only 17% think they're going to spend more, uh, whereas 50% think they're going to spend less, and about 32% will say they're going to spend about the same. You can look at this through the lens of my glass is half full and say that about half of the people think they're going to spend about the same or they're going to spend more, 
or you can look at it from the perspective of my glass is half empty and that half of the people uh, plan on spending less over the next six months. The first time we asked this question, we, we got the response that you see where you see the 47%, the 22%, the, the 31% there. And we, we wanted to crawl in those numbers a little bit more. So we started asking a follow-up question of respondents uh, in the second quarter and again here in the, the third quarter. I've been giving you guys the numbers wrong, haven't I? It's third quarters on the left. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you turned it all around on me there, French. Appreciate that. So of the 22% who said they're going to spend more, we asked the question, um, why are you going to spend more? You know, are you going to spend more because you think you're going to have more money? You think you're going to spend more because items are going to cost more, basically inflation? You know of some major purchases or repairs that you're going to be paying for in the upcoming weeks, or is there some other reason? And, and you can see overwhelmingly people think that things, that items are going to cost more in the next six months. So that's what's driving that lower percentage of people saying that they're going to spend more money. If you're going to spend less money, the reason that you're going to spend less money has been overwhelmingly that people plan to conserve more money, worried about their budgets, worried about their pocketbooks, uh, worried about their uh, checkbooks at the, at the office. Uh, inflation plays almost no role in that. Nobody thinks that the cost of items is, is going to be lower. And I really thought we'd see a little bit higher response to people who maybe have made a major purchase or had to pay for you know, a car repair or buy a new washer and dryer or something like that, and that that might influence why they're not going to spend more, but, but typically it's not. And we don't know what makes up the other category we offered as an alternative. It's clearly uh, 3 in 10, so 33.4 um, in 10. So we do need to analyze that a little bit more going forward. But you can see some consistency between the second quarter and the third quarter there. We asked the question about job conditions, where you live. Are jobs, how would you describe them? Are they hard to find? Are they plentiful? Do you, do you not know? And you can see three-fourths of the people in this state think that jobs are difficult to find. And that has been a real consistent number two over these three quarters, uh, as you can see, which we all hear the anecdotal evidence that it's hard to find a job. We see that in the unemployment numbers ticking up a little bit higher. Uh, but it's clearly the perception is even stronger than probably the actual data is, and that's a theme I'm going to come back to in just a second. In six months, do you expect job conditions to get better or get worse or stay about the same? Again, um, we see some pretty remarkable consistency here. Uh, again, it tends to be much more negative by almost a, a two-to-one, three-to-one margin there in terms of uh, will, will it get better, will it get worse, will it stay about the same? Again, you can look at that through your, your glass being half empty or half full. There's certainly you could take a positive spin from that uh, question result. I mean, right now in this new, in the economy that we're in right now, staying the same is, is doing pretty good. So uh, we asked two new questions in our latest round uh, of polling, and this was one of the questions here. And what we're trying to get at with this question, in the last year, have you or someone you're close to lost his or her job? And the question asked a little bit more than that in terms of, um, I think the exact question was in the last year, have you or someone you're close to, such as a, a family member, a friend, or a neighbor lost a job? So we try to quantify that a little bit. 60% said yes, 40% said no. So we're trying to kind of understand a little bit more the connection. Is there a, a real personal reason why you think some of your attitudes toward the economy are as negative as they are? Could this be a reason why some people do? And, and clearly you've got a, a majority of people who know of someone or are close to someone that they know that has lost a job that's got to have some impact emotionally and um, psychologically on their perceptions about what's going on in the economy. Uh, we also asked this question uh, partly in response to some research being done up at Hendricks College by some students, which we try to do in some of our polling. Um, do you believe that offshoring, also known as outsourcing jobs, has cost people in your community their jobs? Clearly 63.5% said yes to 16% that said no. So there is a perception out there that outsourcing or offshoring has cost jobs in a particular community. Something I think you would expect in some larger communities. Curious to see uh, in the cross tabs whether or not that's the, the case necessarily in some of the smaller communities. I doubt Jay's got it at that level of detail, but I'll throw that out there for him as a challenge. 
Uh, we asked this con uh, question very consistently uh, throughout our data, turning to national business conditions as a whole. Do you think that current business conditions in the U.S. are good or bad or normal? And th this is just an astounding number, and it has been this way, again, you can see consistently for three straight quarters, 80%, 75%, 80.5% think that business conditions are bad. Single digits, I mean three, five, three and a half percent say that it's good. And I, I, we've seen a lot of data across the country and even when I referenced Fort Smith earlier, uh, those numbers have been single digits. So do you think that current business conditions in Arkansas are good, bad, or normal? We've seen some better numbers here. Uh, and we were seeing some numbers when I asked some similar questions like this in some political polling that we did last year, and you still saw some, um, Governor Mike Beebe, for instance, survive uh, his challenge for re-election despite people having a very negative uh, impact of what they thought current business conditions were. So again, 10% average, 50, more than 50% think that uh, current business conditions in Arkansas are bad. Uh, and then others think that it's normal. So combine the good and the normal, and again, you're, you're still just a little under 50% on that. Whoop, I'm going to come back. Oh, hold it just right there, Jay, and I'm going to turn this over to you. One of the things that I, I want to kind of preface before we um, get into some questions with you guys and before I turn over to, to my other two panelists here today is all of this uh, survey data that we've been looking at has really been geared towards uh, perception. And when you poll some of the questions that we've polled, you're asking these questions in the context of what do you think? How do you feel? What do you believe? So that's the response that you're getting is the perception of what people think is actually going on in the economy. When you look at some of the hard data that's going on in the economy, uh, the numbers really don't reflect that pessimism. So there is a huge disconnect in my estimation between what people perceive is going on in the economy and what's actually happening. I mean, you've got bank profitability is on the rise. You've got uh, unemployment's not been improving. It's been negative, so you would think that it might go in that direction. You've got uh, stock market's been performing okay um, over the last, if you look at it in a, a broader context. Um, You've got uh, state revenues on the rise because individual income tax collections are coming up, sales tax collections are coming up. So there is some good news out there in the economy and it's getting reported, but it's not sinking into the psyche of the consumer over here when you see uh, what's going on. So Jay, I'll turn over to you. Thanks, Roby. Um, my slides aren't as pretty as, uh, as their slides, but uh, but, but the numbers are just as good. Um, the, um, I'm going to just make three or four points, and then I'll be, be glad to answer any questions uh, as we move on. And I want to, um, the first big point that I want to talk about really is um, the power of uh, this ongoing personal contact with people that you know who have lost a job in shaping uh, a whole array of perceptions uh, about the uh, about jobs in the economy. And this was, uh, we, we know the social psychological literature is really uh, pretty clear that uh, this personalization of these fairly abstract issues really does shape perceptions. We really see that here with this, with this question where we see the split uh, in, in folks who know someone close to them who's lost a job and those who's not. And we, I'm going to just show a series of slides and the ways in which uh, the answer on that question really does shape uh, a whole array of attitudes. The first is, of course, on, um, on job availability, uh, a huge gap there of folks who've, who've, um, who do know someone who's lost a job. You know, over 85% say jobs are hard to find. Uh, that drops significantly, about 30 points, uh, for those who don't know someone who has lost a job. Um, as we move um, to state economic conditions, uh, we, uh, which is uh, 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 the, the, one of the last issues Roby dealt with, uh, we see the difference there as well. Um, you know, uh, two-thirds of those who do know someone who's lost a job say state economic conditions are bad. Over half uh, of those who, who don't uh, say, uh, say the, the that state economic conditions are normal, uh, are about 65 percent, about two-thirds who say it's either normal or good. Um, and then, to a lesser degree, moving to national 
uh, conditions. That also is, uh, is, is less powerful, but also shapes perceptions of, of national uh, economic uh, conditions. And so I think that we have a variety of ways in, in which this uh, is shown. And then I think it's also very relevant in kind of uh, looking to the future, in looking in six months. Is the state of the economy going to be better? Again, uh, this knowledge of somebody who's lost a job or not, uh, very powerful uh, in that respect. And we see also something interesting in terms of the, the blame for, uh, uh, for the loss of jobs. And we see those who uh, do know somebody who's lost a job really likely to say outsourcing is a source uh, of, of job loss. Um, and so it's a, a very interesting connection here. And so I think what's important about this array of, uh, of results related to uh, the, the interrelationship between knowing somebody who's lost a job and, and these variety of indicators, I think really does show that these abstract percentages of, of, uh, of uh, unemployment rates, you know, moving from 8.4 to 8.5, I mean, that's not only uh, thousands of Arkansans, but that is tens of thousands of those Arkansans, friends, uh, family members. And so the attitudes about uh, the state of the economy and future, the future of that economy is really shaped uh, by those real world experiences of people knowing someone who, um, who has lost a job. And I think that's a really important um, 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 insight from, from this data. Um, I, w I wanna go into the outsourcing data a little bit more, and I can't go to the detail um, uh, that at least I didn't have in the last couple of days time to, to go as deep as Roby was, uh, was asking uh, in his opening question. But I do think there is this really interesting connection between, uh, between outsourcing and attitudes about the national uh, economy. And we really do see a lot of blame, uh, I think interestingly, placed on uh, outsourcing as one of uh, the forces that is really shaping uh, negative uh, economic conditions for the United States uh, as a whole. And so I think that there is some interesting, um, interesting things going on there. And I think as we move ahead to kind of the next political season, I think that we, we may well see uh, kind of the use of that issue in some apparently fairly powerful ways as a source of, of blame uh, for what's going on um, economically. The next big point I want to make is looking at the relationship between some demographics and some of these uh, attitudes on, on, on the economy. Um, and uh, the most uh, kind of consistent uh, uh, relationships that we see here are that uh, Arkansans of different income levels really do perceive the economy in different ways. And I think this is probably not super surprising, but I think is, is worth uh, taking uh, a look at. And the, the uh, demographic information related to income that was in the survey uh, focused on household income uh, and asked people to place themselves in one of four categories, uh, less than $50,000 a year, 50 to $75,000 a year, 75 to 100, and then those uh, above 100,000 uh, for their household income. Um, and we see a variety of ways in which, uh, in which folks uh, um, in the top category, uh, 100,000 or more, uh, much more likely to, I think, feel positively uh, about the economy comparatively. And again, recognizing everybody views the economy negatively, but <laughs> certainly uh, it is those who, uh, who are in the, in the lowest income group that are more likely, most likely to say that their own personal economic situation had gotten worse uh, in the last six, six months. Uh, we also see uh, that the, that group is most likely to say that jobs are uh, hard to find, over three and four. That's, uh, I think, a, uh, a problem, certainly among those 100,000 or more, where six and 10 do, but there is a significant uh, gap. The really, uh, and then on the state economy, we also see, I think, the, one of the biggest gaps in that, uh, you know, um, when you combine the good and normal, um, above those 100,000 100, or above, you know, you've got 66 percent, about two-thirds, who say the state economic conditions are good or normal, but 
57 percent of those less than 50,000 a year household income say it's bad. And so I think we do see some really interesting um, in, uh, change across uh, income levels. And so that this, these, this economy in which we're living is affecting people, uh, or at least their perceptions, in different ways based on where they come economic, uh, where they are in terms of their own economic lives, except when it comes to the national economy. And this, uh, I think, is interesting. How permanent and entrenched uh, perceptions of the national economic conditions are. There you see kind of a universal, about 80 percent across the board, uh, no matter their income level, saying that national economic conditions are bad. And so I think that has really become entrenched, that the national economy is bad. And I think a point that, that Roby made, this disconnect uh, between the national economy, economy and perceptions of it and the state economy, I think is an important story. And we certainly did see in last, uh, uh, the last election cycle uh, the, the, the fact that Governor Beebe, I think, did a very successful job of really saying, you know, things are bad in Arkansas, but they certainly are nowhere near as bad uh, as things are nationally. And I think that's an important uh, uh, story. Uh, another, maybe the only happy point in this whole presentation, uh, and it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, my, you know, I'm, I'm an, I'm an optimist. I always look for happiness even in, in uh, utter despair. But uh, here we, uh, we have a situation where, um, interestingly, young people are, are relatively uh, optimistic. Um, those under 30, uh, and we got a pretty good sample, uh, Roby and I are polling, we, we often have difficulty getting uh, younger participants in our polls. Uh, they're a little hard to find uh, on their, in their cell phone only world. Uh, but we did get a pretty good uh, sample of those un under 30. And when you look at their own personal economic situation in the last six months, um, you know, I'm a lot more likely to say that it's gotten uh, better. Uh, they are uh, significantly more likely to say that jobs are plentiful, recognizing that even two-thirds of them say they, they would say they're hard to find, but comparatively, uh, things uh, are, are a little better for, for younger folks. Um, they're a, a little more optimistic about the state economic conditions. Um, uh, even a little more optimistic, though still pessimistic as a group, about national economic conditions, but they, you know, um, they, they, they are different than their older uh, um, uh, citizens. And then especially look into the future. You know, it's a fairly optimistic group, uh, is that this group does have some sense that the, the future does look a little brighter in terms of their economic world. And so I think there is a little happiness uh, in, in this survey. The final demographic uh, 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 indicators I want to look at is, is race and ethnicity. And we do see some interesting patterns here. I just only want to look at a couple of slides. But um, it is interesting that the most um, economically challenged subgroups of the population historically in Arkansas, African Americans and Latinos, um, are, uh, while not optimistic, of course, about, in this case, state economic conditions, um, more likely to say um, that, uh, uh, that, that things are going to be getting a little better, uh, that things are, are, are not that bad, um, and uh, are likely to say that conditions are normal. Uh, and we also see that true in terms of the future, is that I think we see a little more optimism among uh, racial and ethnic minority groups uh, than we do among, uh, among white citizens. And so, uh, you know, 88% of African Americans say that in the few, six months from now, I expect my economic situation to be uh, better uh, or the same, uh, and about 88% of Latinos. And, and so it is certainly white Arkansans who are the most pessimistic, pessimistic group. Um, and so those are just a few of the cross tabs. I can probably answer some more questions. I've looked through a lot more of the data, but I just wanted to throw a few of the highlights up here uh, today. French? I thought, Jay, those were terrific cross tabs, and certainly I think you come out, I feel uh, more optimistic after seeing the detail than even looking at the top numbers, because I think that is, that's pretty intriguing. Well, Roby asked a very uh, interesting question, which is, are people's perceptions of the situation worse than the reality? And if you look at the economic statistics, the, the leading economic indicators are all pointing up and pointing up steeply. And that would make you think, looking back over a long period of time, that the economy is improving. But if you listen to television news or read the newspaper, you would just have absolutely the opposite point of view. And to some reason, I think this is the conundrum I think politicians find themselves in. 
which is they want to recognize when things are going better, but they know that doesn't help them to get out in front of that issue of either party for, for multiple different reasons. And therefore, their, their message to you daily is that it's bad. Uh, we're trying to keep it from becoming worse. Uh, if you're the administration or if you're in Congress, we're going to try to innovate to do something better than the administration. And so you get this very circular logic. And I want to show um, the first graph I want to show is this one, uh, which is uh, an academic study that's been done recently and released in the last uh, week or so called the Index of Economic Policy Uncertainty. And this goes back to 1985. <clears throat> And you can see uh, famous events in, in history along the way. I don't know if this yeah, it works, but I don't know if it's going to show. Yeah. Uh, so here's uh, the, uh, the 90s uh, during the, uh, the Clinton administration. Uh, you would say that there was economic policy certainty by the lack of volatility in this uh, curve. Uh, but at the, uh, with 9-11, and with the Gulf War and the Iraq War, uh, a high degree of uncertainty, followed by when President Bush W. was reelected, it dropped a little bit and showed some stability, and we knew where the economic policy decision-making of the country was going. But look at it since the crash in, in 08. It's gone up, it's gone up in, a, in just a sort of a crazy feature and stayed up with no resolution. And I believe that that is a real source for the uneasiness for people when they think about their future, uh, answering a question about their future economic situation is they are uncertain. And you hear that word cast about and no one seems to know what uh, to do about it. But it is brought about by August, uh, the debt ceiling controversy that was uh, debated in August, the loss of the AAA rating of the U.S. Treasury market in August. And it's reflected in our stock market. Just since August 8th, the S&P has had a trading range of 1,450 points. That's a, a massive amount of a trading range in the last uh, uh, two months. In fact, uh, it's the fifth time in 100 years it's been that volatile. Uh, if you backed out the three worst days, we'd be up 16%. So this year has been uh, characterized by extreme volatility, and I think that carries on into our opinion poll response lives. So I wanted to leave that uh, chart with you for thought. Uh, it's out on the web, if you, and you can read more about how they did it. Uh, Index of Economic Policy Uncertainty. If you Google that, you can bring it up. The next one I wanted to leave with you speaks to, uh, I think, Jay Barr's uh, very excellent point, which is if you know someone who's unemployed, and I'm going to explain this, don't freak out. Uh, if you know someone who's lost their job, you're far more likely to be you know, a bit pessimistic when you're answering questions, not only about yourself, but about the state and the national economy. Here, this is post-peak recovery and employment for every recession since World War II. So all these lines represent a recession since the Second World War, and it starts out where the, uh, getting the economy back to where it was before the recession. So for us, we're measuring bringing and taking employment back to July of 2007. That's where our, our employment peaked. And what you see is this pattern you read about in the newspaper about V-shaped recoveries, and we're not having one. And we haven't had one since the 1992-3 recession. The black line is the 90 recession, which contributed to George H.W. Bush losing and the pro-Clinton-Bush race in 92. That was the, quote, bad economy that we were supposedly living through then. This line, this saucer-shaped line, is the end of President Clinton's administration and the beginning of President Bush's administration when we had the recession that started in 2000 during the election year and was exacerbated by the attack in 9-11. And this monster right here is the current loss of employment that we are involved in. So these are more saucer-shaped. And you can see that in the 90 recession, it took 30 months to get back to the pre-recession employment level. 
In George W. Bush's recession at the end of Clinton, beginning of Bush, it took 46 months, four years, to get back to the pre-recession employment level in the country. And this is what has all the economists concerned, is the depth of our current recession. It was down 6% from peak, uh, about 8 million people or so. And it's on a trajectory now that would be, say, second quarter 2014, before you could even have a shot at getting back to 2007 employment levels. And we really don't know. I mean, that's, you can't take a ruler and make a straight line here because our economy is much more dynamic than that. But this, too, I think, contributes to uh, the responses in, in a public opinion poll about how do you think the future job focus is going to be. Uh, a couple of other points on employment. Uh, one, the average unemployment is 40, unemployment has been 40 weeks, and so this is many times the post-World War II average. So again, not only are people unemployed, but they've been in, unemployed longer. If you have a, 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 a college degree, the unemployment rate is less than 5%. If you have a PhD, it's less than 2%. So the real challenge here is this job match issue that you read so much about. President Obama's talked a lot about it. In fact, in his Jobs Act, he has proposed a Georgia program where people can go back and get job training uh, while, and continue to receive unemployment benefits while they get that job training, for example. But what you'll find, in, in my judgment, in looking at the data, that over almost 50% of that 8 million loss in jobs was related to the construction industry. So housing, direct housing, uh, people who make concrete, people who make carpet at Mohawk and sell it through Home Depot, the whole number, both direct jobs in the construction industry and the indirect jobs that service the residential construction industry, in my view, is almost half the loss of jobs since the peak. And you know, you're not going to get those jobs back quickly until we have a recovery in the housing markets. And we won't get a housing recovery until we chew up and uh, get through our inventory around the country in housing. So uh, I think that's one reason why at, at UALR they announced last week or a couple weeks ago that uh, of their College of Business graduates, 70 percent of their May graduates had found a job and 60 percent of those were, had found a job in the area they were interested in as opposed to uh, just a job of any kind. And those were sort of encouraging about the job market here for a college grad in Arkansas. So with that, I think I'll conclude and we'll take some questions. All right. Uh, look like it's more half empty than half full, Roby. That's good. All right, questions. Uh, Wally, hold on. We'll wait for the microphone, please. I've got a question for how the uh, survey is, is uh, asked. Over what time frame are you asking people when you say, do you know someone who's lost a job? And as a follow-up, do you ever ask them, do you know anyone who has gotten a job during the same time frame? Yeah. Well, we've not asked that follow-up question that you mentioned there, but we do all of our polling typically in one night, um, although we did this poll over the course of two nights, Wednesday and Thursday of just last week. So we, we don't often go beyond two nights of polling. How far back since they lost jobs over the past three months, a year? One, one year. One year. Okay. Questions? Yes, sir. Well, microphone's coming right at you. Jay, uh, Jay, on your earlier, or some of the earlier slides, you showed that 10, 12 percent of folks who thought uh, things were getting better. Uh, do you have any tracking going on or any longitudinal work where you could sort of see where those people end up? Because your uh, presentation showed it fairly flat, as though these might be the same people every quarter, whereas in fact it's quite likely that some of those people moved into another category places then being filled by other people who now felt like things were a little better. And I just wondered if you were able to track that. Yeah, this is not panel. Uh, Jim, this isn't panel data. It's, it's cross-sectional data, and so it's a new group of folks. 
each quarter and so we aren't really we aren't seeing change we aren't able to track change across time in that way i mean that obviously i think you know well panel data is very complicated because to be able to track the same folks across time is 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 very very pricey as a for survey and we just don't have that that capability at that this point in time so this is a little bit blunter instrument and you may be on to something but i do think that we have you know we are pretty conscious of of being sure that we we have our kansans who look like the group uh, before in terms of some of the key demographics uh, and so uh, I, I feel pretty confident that that uh, um, you know we're, we're getting good good samples each time all right yes question right there bill this is uh, regarding the slide about how our kansans viewed the arkansas economy versus how they view the national economy given the the kind of open door policy we had towards drilling in the fayetteville shale and the return of, of that activity, um, do you think that we're going to have an exponentially harsh downfall from that, or do you think it will cushion us? I'll start out and, and say that um, you're talking about when, when those wells are completely drilled out. Is that the presumption in your question? Or? Well, I mean, I guess, you know, if you take into effect, you know, the highways and right. potential future, you know, if the EPA changes the laws and we find out that it's a lot worse than we thought it was, we, you know, c compared to Pennsylvania and other states, we did very little as far as regulating the industry. Right. And what I want to know is if, I mean, do we see our studies being done on long-term potential health risks or other things? Will the fallout from it, do you think it'll be worse than we think or less than we think? Okay, so cost-benefit of just the activity itself. Yeah, I think there are studies being done on that as it relates to water quality, and uh, uh, which would be number one, and number two would just be just general wear and tear on the highways in the uh, counties affected. Uh, and I think you'll find that net-net, based on the studies I've read so far, and some of them are EPA national studies on water quality. They released one about two weeks ago. Uh, it's do being done in three different areas of the country, and it relates to essentially uh, uh, any water quality damage generally. So not just from hydraulic fracking a mile below the surface where you've got a, uh, some sort of a problem, but in the transportation of water and storage of water and the retention of water in these ponds. And that's so far determined that there is no material negative impact to groundwater in this EPA uh, series of studies. But I think they'll be going on for years. And my gut instinct would be that the uh, economic activity uh, that's positive will outweigh the benefits uh, from it based on what we're reading today. And I think it'll vary from country to country, not U.S., I don't mean countries, but I mean locations within the United States potentially because of the geologic formation and the depth of drilling and the uh, amount of population because our area where we're drilling is not the most populous place on the planet compared to uh, even rural New York and Pennsylvania. I have a question right up here. Right here. I was wondering two, two things. One, on the um, less than 50,000, 50 to 75, 75 to 100, over 100, how many of the Arkansas percentage of population or households falls in that first bend, the under 50? And then this is kind of a totally different question, but on this graph, it seems to me like part of the depth of the curve is going to depend on the starting point. In other words, was the, the peak, which might have been 5% in one case and 6 in another, or, uh, how, much, how much range or variability is there in that starting point? In other words, are we trying to get back jobs that maybe we were at a peak, an unusual peak of employment, and there may be underlying more chronic trends. Um, yeah, just, Eddie, just quick, uh, on our sample, 60% um, of, of the sample was under 50%, uh, at or under 50%. Um, and so uh, there, was, there was probably a little bit of a skew um, up, but it, it, you know, it was not a, a dramatically skewed. Sometimes polling on issues like this, um, uh, wealthier folks are really overrepresented. These were, this, I think it wasn't a bad sample in that regard. 
Yeah, you ask a great question about uh, going back to the ideal effectively. So in each instance, this is not, you know, this is not indexed for what a uh, normalized unemployment rate would be. This is going back to what employment was at the uh, period before the recession started. So if you think that we were at an extraordinary uh, low level of unemployment in 2005, 2006, 2007, which a lot of economists would say we, we were, say in the 5% range, where during the 80s, even though we had a wonderful boom and created uh, many millions of jobs, uh, Jim Metzger or Jay can tell us, 30 million maybe during the whole uh, period of jobs, we still had an unemployment rate that was in the sixes, uh, six and a half range. So it's a good question, and uh, this graph doesn't address it. So we might cross a 6% unemployment rate, you know, sooner than going back to a July of 07 uh, unemployment rate that included a lot of people building condominiums in Florida at that time. Any additional questions? Uh, I, yes, right here. No, yeah, well, hold on a second. But if there's one behind you, Jim, and then, then we'll okay. Between the real economic numbers and the numbers that you're seeing in people's experience of how they're doing, uh, we made a thesis that, that they're not the same there is a disconnect. What do you think is going on and what do we need to do about it? Yeah, that was the question I was hoping I'd get to ask all of you guys. <laughs> we could all make a lot of money if we could answer that question. So uh, I, don't, I don't have a solution. I mean, I just think time. I think grinding its way out. Um, I think if you look at this graph right here that French has brought up, there's typically been something dramatic that has pulled us back up. I do think jobs are a big key. If we started hearing more positive and, saw, and seeing more positive jobs news, I think that that would definitely start move the, moving the needle some. And it could be. But in years past, you've seen a much quicker and sharper rebound um, overall in some of these other uh, results that are up here. I, I, to me, if you've got a job, you're feeling better about things. If you're anxious about your job, you're feeling pretty bad about things. And I don't try to dumb it down or simplify it, but you know that's typically the, the two statistics that I keep my eye on. I mean, I, I watch a lot of different stuff, but the two things that I always monitor for my snapshot of where I think things are going to go are unemployment, and it, at the state level, I look at sales tax collections because if people are spending money that's probably a pretty good sign that things are going to go one direction or the other. And if jobs are going up trend-wise, that's not a good sign. If jobs are going down, that is a good sign. So those are my two kind of immediate first looks when I look at um, statistical data. All right, now we have a question right here. This question right there. Then we'll come to you. No, right there. I think Jim, and then we'll. All right, thank you. Um, I guess this is for French and the uh, chart you had on the volatility index um, increasing quite a bit as also globalization has been increasing and I'm wondering I mean theoretically long term globalization should actually act to dampen volatility but in this short term period of increased globalization are we seeing this sort of almost ricochet effect back and forth Europe Asia US in terms of uh, episodes with subprime lending or sovereign debt in Europe. And, and the whole world seems to react in a way that is difficult to know very, very well what's going to happen in the near term. There's no doubt that it's impacted. I mean, we have phone calls. We have a lot of our, our bankers here today. And it's amazing. Uh, you know, 10 years ago, we would not have a dramatic number of phone calls from our investment clients who ask us, you know, what's going on in Greece? I mean, Greece was a, you know, marginally interesting place to go on vacation, particularly if you're in, into archaeology. Uh, but, you know, it is, it does, it does have impact globally. There is a ricochet effect. Uh, the U.S. banking system, I think, uh, debt and indirect debt and debt guarantees, you, you, know, you know about this debt guarantee business now, which is what got AIG into trouble. Those things are well known, they're fairly transparent, and the U.S. institutions are not, you know, uh, you know in any sort of, in my judgment, extremely strung out position on the so-called pig countries of Europe. Uh, Portugal, Italy, Ireland, Spain, and uh, Greece. 
uh, this pigs is not spelled properly there, but you get the, you get the point. Um, those countries have high levels of uh, debt to GDP. They are deeply indebted to the French and German banks, and that's what this debate is all about. Uh, but it is, I think it's irrational, the amount of impact it's had in our stock market. Um, and, you know, yes, the Federal Reserve will play a role with the IMF and the European Central Bank in resolving that, but to say that that should make the price of Tyson dramatically swing one direction or another is, has surprised me. But we do live in an interconnected world. It is contributing to that volatility chart because, again, it's in the news. And the basis for this chart is news stories that have certain keywords in them. Okay, we have this, you, had, you had your question for our final question here. I uh, had some personal experience with young people just graduated from college trying to get a job. And it seems like it's a hard time for young people to get a job, not just the people I know, but other people. And I was wondering if the universities, such as the Clinton School or Hendrix, are they tracking that situation? Are they trying to address that situation with some knowledge? Uh, I just was curious about that, if they're doing anything <clears throat> about it. Jay, you want to start now? Yeah. I'll answer. I mean, I, I do think that it, it's been a, a particularly interesting period for folks working in career services um, at colleges and universities. And I do think that, that, that several things are going on, thinking about uh, both during one's life at college and the ways in which that can enhance marketability. I think there's a lot more emphasis on doing internships during the college years to prepare one for, uh, for, for life uh, after college. Um, and, uh, and also thinking about you know, alternative paths immediately after college, especially in, in, at Hendricks in particular, in terms of service opportunities, uh, AmeriCorps and other opportunities like that, that, uh, that may be ways to kind of um, um, short-term bypass the job market uh, to help, and, but at the same time help prepare folks for, after, uh, for later on. Something we were talking about before we came out was the fact that we, I think schools are not doing a very good job in terms of debt counseling uh, during college, and I think we, we were kind of talking about that a lot of the, the angst that, that is being shown, I think, right now uh, by younger Americans uh, who have come out of college is kind of this, uh, this amazing debt that they, they are holding, and that colleges and universities, I think, are letting uh, young people down in that regard. Um, but I think on the, on the career front, I think there are some, they are responding in some, in some good and innovative ways. Should yeah, I, I agree. The, um, we are spending more and more time working with individual students and with graduates on job counseling and job placement. We have a course, uh, a professionalism course, where we teach everything from interviewing to resumes to networking to do, doing all that, uh, really trying to prepare students because we, this job market is something uh, that we've not seen before. And, and it, is, uh, it is scary. We get graduate students in who bring with us mounds of student loan debt before they get here. As a professional school, what we try to do is keep our tuition and costs reasonable and affordable, and at the same time, work very hard with each of the individual students in helping them develop a post-Clinton school life. Now, I get criticized for that sometimes because some students will say, well, that's not you know, that may not be the most strongest academic course in the world. And I said, well, in the long term, it's the most real academic course. Uh, and we, we, we have to prepare you. So we're very proud of our career placement rate. We're running at about 85% within six months after graduation. But we're a small school and we're able to, to work it. But student loan debt has exceeded credit card debt in this country. It's not going to go away with bankruptcy. It is a huge issue. Jay is right. There needs to be family counseling. There needs to be more college counseling on what this debt means. I mean, you know, if, if we need a branch bank on campus, we need financial counseling because people are borrowing money and living off of it with the belief that it's going to hit out there sometime uh, in, in, in the long term. Well, it's six months after graduation. 
And what really impacts this study, and what I think has some impact on these numbers, is that for the last two graduating classes, undergraduates, um, less than 40% of those who applied for jobs got one. So the UALR numbers, the Clinton School numbers, colleges have really, really got to work at it. So we're trying, but 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 it is a it is a mountain. And look, my message to you as parents, if don't pile this debt on your students. I'm just telling you that they, they, they don't have jobs coming out of college. It is a huge concern. And I think it's going to impact Arkansas's economy for the next five to 10 years in a very negative way. I just would add uh, back to this point about the lower unemployment rates, the more education you have. I think the, the challenge is still that we've tried to convert our community colleges into liberal arts schools uh, and over the years. And that's just, and we've, we've, we've removed a lot of the vocational aspect of it, like that's a dirty word sometimes, you know? And so you see Ohio State and uh, several company, uh, schools in Ohio creating uh, the necessary uh, academic, I guess, uh, classes for people to become welders. Uh, job wanted advertising is up and up dramatically from 09. It's been a positive number for 12 months. There are hundreds of thousands of jobs out there and we're not connecting people with the skills they need. They need to be computer literate. Even if you're going to do welding, you need math skills, you need computer literacy skills. Uh, I'm sure uh, Fred could talk about, you know, in the steel industry, what a person needs to know now versus maybe what they needed to know 25 or 30 years ago. It's a much more technologically based uh, uh, curricula. So that change is, needs to happen and we don't need, in my view, to kind of broaden the community college offering. We need to make sure that people who go there can really get the skills they need to find the jobs that are available in that locale. Do we need more bankers? We do not need any more bankers. <laughs> well, with that, we know we don't need more bankers. Thank you all for coming. Let's give our panel a round of applause.